My name is Raquel Buchanan with Glendale Counseling and Wellness, and I'm here with Herman Reyes. Hi. Today we're going to be discussing death positivity and the unique experience of a funeral service practitioner. Death is something that does not discriminate. It is an event that we are all susceptible to and something that we have to deal with at some time or another. So, uh, Herman, tell me a little bit about what it is you do. Well, currently what I am is a mortuary science student. Um, aside from that, I have been employed within the death care industry. Um, I've seen things from removals to full embalmings to working services. So my past experiences have given me the um, process of knowledge of what goes on in regards to funeral service. I, I feel like I've seen a good amount than what other people in the industry have seen like if you just do funeral directing or if you just embalm i've i've been able to see the whole circle of the way that things go from start to finish tell me what inspired you to join death care services um i was i was i think about three to four years old i had been at my very first funeral it was a funeral for a family friend who was gunned down he was at the wrong time at the wrong place and um i remember my mother carrying me over to this wooden box that's what i would call it and this gentleman who i've seen like once or twice before he was lying in this box now i've seen media you know i i was always left to my own devices in front of the tv so i knew what was going on i knew that this guy was not alive but i reached out and touched him and he was really cold and my mother was crying and I asked my mother, Monty, why are you crying? You know, um, why did he die? And my mother, she told me, oh, sweetie, he's not dead. He, he's asleep. And ever since then, um, I kind of developed this anger towards the situation because I knew better, but I knew my mother was trying to protect me. But I wanted to understand more. I was a very curious child. I wanted to know why are these people crying? Why, why does this feel like this occasion is too sad? I mean, I remember running up and down the church pews and I was told, you can't run here, it's a funeral. And since that moment, I had gone to more funerals and I just got really um, curious. Why is it that death so sad what is death i i knew what death was but i didn't know the total finality of it so growing up i was always curious about the way that we grieve about how we mourn in the different cultures i'm i'm from a very hispanic culture and we do grief grieving we're up in we're up face to face with death i mean um we have a day specifically for that uh, the day of the dead and uh, growing up and seeing the way that other people dealt with death and their feelings that really made me interested in As we can say the rest is history <laughs> So what I hear you saying is that from a very young age You were told how to grieve you were told how to handle death and what is acceptable and what is mm -hmm. not acceptable Yeah, okay. Okay, so that um, that brings me into like we were talking before in our conversation mm -hmm. about uh, what have you learned in school about death? I have learned that death, well, we know what death is, you know, it is the end of life. It is the end of all vital signs. But one thing that I've learned is that not everybody grieves the same way. I like to say grief is like a thumbprint. It is unique to everyone and anything. Um, for example, the way that a child may grieve is very different than from what an adult would grieve. Obviously, there's different factors of age and culture, but I believe that with coming with a new generation, especially this millennial generation, the way that we grieve for our dead and the way that we mourn and all that, it's really changing and it's a great thing to see as, as weird or macabre as that may sound. You're wearing a shirt. It says uh, death revolutionary. It says Revol death revolutionary. <laughs> so tell me about that. Well, um, a death revolutionary is someone who wants to change the industry. Um, I believe that death has been taken from us. You know, we have the American funeral death care industry. And what I feel is from my studies and from talks of 
other people within the death care industry and out of it is we don't have a good relationship with death. There's a death that occurs and we know we have to call the funeral director. We have to do this. And there are so many missed opportunities in regards to this process of dealing with our dead loved ones um, in regards to methods of disposition. And it's because of the fact that, as I said it before, we don't have a good relationship with death. And me, I call myself a death revolutionary because I want to talk about death. Mm -hmm. I want to bring death from the covers that it's been tucked under. I want us to have a healthy conversation about death because at the end of the day, we're all going to die. So you've studied the psychology of death. What would you say is the relationship like between uh, us and, and feelings of death right now? I believe that we will acknowledge death, but we'll ignore it at the same time. And that will go towards masking techniques. For example, someone that doesn't want to openly acknowledge a death that has occurred, they'll use other techniques to prolong their grief. Um, for example, like taking pills or using sex or alcoholism. Um, I've met people in my life who refuse to talk about a death that has occurred, but they'll realize towards the end that that actually does damage. It can lead to what's known as chronic grief or complicated grief. And at the end of the day, you can't tell someone how to grieve, but if you try to aid someone, if someone knows, you know, what they're going through and not many people do because again, death is highly denied in this society. We what can what is it that contributes to uh, the denial, the negative relationship that we have with death right now? As, as much as it pains me to say this, I think this is part of the death care industry's fault, you know, um, I know I've been taught that the dead human body can be seen as a danger or a hazard to the public, which it is not. It is absolutely not a threat or a danger. An unembalmed body is not a danger whatsoever. So because many people are uneducated, especially law enforcement agencies or even healthcare providers, they'll tell the family, oh my gosh, so-and-so died, you need to call the funeral home right now. And the funeral home's job is to come and do what is process known as a removal or a first call, and they're going to take the loved one into the care. And basically, your relationship with the death has been cut off because you've entrusted someone in good faith to take care of your loved one, you know, prepare them for their disposition and their funeral services. And I think the American death care industry has contributed to it. I don't think it was in a malicious way, but it's just the way that it goes. And if we see someone getting murdered, obviously we're not going to have a relationship with the murder itself, but we're going to call the cops. We're going to know we have a set formula of the way that we're doing. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get educated in all rounds of the industry and see how can I help people? How can I help aid in having a good relationship with speaking about death so that when the time comes for a person to say goodbye to their loved one as they're being taken care of by the funeral home, have they had enough time? You know, because when you have a funeral service, you're gonna have about four hours or so. To some people, they may need more time. Um, California is a home death care state where you don't need a funeral home to take care of your loved one. You can do it yourself. You can file the paperwork. I mean, in regards to the final disposition, such as cremation or burial, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to contract through a funeral home for liability purposes. But yeah, um, you can have the relationship with death and have it um, face first at you. I mean, when my uncle died from ALS, we got to do just that. His funeral services were on the same day at home. Um, he was bathed, he was washed, he was um, redressed. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, it wasn't until we said it was okay that mm -hmm. the funeral home took. Yeah, you and I have talked about how the industrialization of death care has contributed to a decrease in intimacy 
in uh, death and how and how that's affected um, our perception of death. Absolutely. Um, like I told you in my culture, and I know in Mexico, um, what's known as home death care here is a norm over there. You know, there's not a lot of money and bombing really isn't that big in Mexico. So they'll take care of their dead. Uh, the way that home death care what they'd want they'd even build the casket or coffin depending on its shape and that to me is an intimate process you know it's taking taking your loved one taking care of them so you can see them until they're at their final resting place and because of the fact that there are some states where you have to contract through a funeral home that's where the intimacy is cut it's almost like it's saying okay you can do this but only if you do this mm -hmm. and i mean i can only speak i've only lived in california luckily california isn't like that people can have that intimacy with death or practice their death customs prior to the um providing it as legal but at the end some places don't have that and that's where the intimacy is cut off so when you are in school and you're learning the things that you learn in your, mor in your mortuary science, yes, what is that preparing you to do within the field? Um, one thing that it prepares you for the field, many people like to refer to it as embalming college or embalming school. They feel, oh, you don't need to go there. It's only if you want to be an embalmer. That is not the case. I know during my studies, I've learned how to run basically my own business. You are taught accounting. You are taught... Um, one of my favorite subjects is funeral law. You are taught the certain laws of what can and cannot be done because at the end of the day, um, we have a fiduciary duty to take care of our clients, meaning we can get sued. We get sued a lot. So if we're going to be educated, we're not just going to be educated on doing what my teachers like to um, call vascular plumbing. Embalming is not everything in regards to the industry. It is one small part of um, my education. It will basically teach me by the end of, by the time I graduate, what I need to start to be able to run my own funeral firm. One thing that I liked you were saying about your education and what it prepares you to do is, I forgot the term you used, but it's where we expect the customers to be informed. But it... Oh, um, well, this is based by the Federal Trade Commission. We practice what is known as caveat vendetor, meaning let the seller beware. For example, let's say if you, Raquel, were to go to a dealership and you bought a car, turns out you paid for the car, well, you walked out, you signed a contract, and you said, this is my car. You cannot turn back and try to return the car because it's not what you liked. It's not what you thought it was going to be. Because you as a, manu as a consumer should have done your research. Well, in regards to regulations of the death care industry, we have to practice the opposite. Where Because of the fact that people are grieving, and to me, grief can kind of be compared to being inebriated. You're not seeing clearly, you're not thinking well, all you're thinking is, I have to do this. And so unfortunately, not every funeral provider does this, but you do have those bad apples that will inevitably take advantage of the situation. And it is our job to fully educate the consumer what they're purchasing. Um, it's known as a right of selection. They can they only need to purchase those items that they want mm -hmm. unless um, certain laws or certain, um, for example, embalming, it is not required by law except for certain instances, like a lot of ship outs, they'll require that they'll be embalmed. But aside from that, we have to keep our consumers mm -hmm. um, knowledge in regards to what they're buying mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it's a personal service. It is known as a personal service contract and any breach of that contract, we are held liable. So so in the death care revolution that you're attempting to put out there and you want to gather more people, you're letting them know that these uh, unintimate ways, you don't have to participate in that. You can do it a different way. Absolutely, yes, you can do it a different way. There is so, so many ways to, um, take care of your dad, especially for disposition. I mean, cremation is on the rise. It is, 
it is up there. It is one of the most seen dispositions. It's not how it used to be where it's straight burial in a cemetery. And what you can do with cremated remains is remarkable. You can put them in fireworks. You can um, become a tree. You can be in a snow globe. It, the sky's the limit, almost literally. Mm -hmm. And this gives it uh, a more personal feel that would probably aid in the grief process. Yes, we're in the age of what I like to call the age of personalization. Like, I, I know I'm a millennial, you're a millennial. We love things personalized and catered to us. So that's where I think that the industry is really changing is we're not doing what is known as cookie cutter funerals anymore. We're doing funerals to meet our needs because at the end of the day, um, like I was telling you earlier, the funeral service is not for the dead person. They don't need anything from us. Mm -hmm. They can be on the floor and just be rotting. They're, they're good for us we're going to grieve. We're the ones that, that are going to be going through these emotions. So why not tailor it to what we feel is going to meet our needs? Mm -hmm. You're going to come across, uh, Herman, a lot of grieving families, bereaved individuals. What is some advice or tips or suggestions that you would give to individuals who are in, in the bereavement? One of the things that they teach us in school is if you see that a family is so, they're just not in the state. For example, you'll have a family that they'll come straight from the hospital, like literally five minutes after the loved one is pronounced dead and says, and say, you know, we, we gotta be, we, we gotta be genuine with our families. You are in no position to make funeral arrangements at the moment. So if I see that a family is going to be like that, I'd say, you know what? If you wanna utilize us, go ahead. We will take your loved one into our care, but come back in a day or two, get other affairs in order. We will, we will be here when, when you're ready. Um, I, I don't recommend people rushing into arrangement services because, you know, like I said, grief is almost like being inebriated. If you cannot, you cannot make sound decisions. Mm -hmm. Some people can, some people can. It's, it, it all depends on the individual. Okay. So before I go any farther, I had some misconceptions about what death positivity was. I thought it was sort of like if someone wanted to die, let them because eventually we're all going to die. But that is not, that's not what it is. What is death positivity? Death positivity is having a good relationship with death. It is openly talking about it. It is openly acknowledging that, yes, we're going to die, but you know what? Let's have a healthy discussion about it. Um, we there's this thing called thanatophobia which is the phobia of one's own mortality you'd be surprised how many practitioners in the death care industry are thanatophobic they're afraid of their own death even healthcare professionals um it's probably because you know they're trying to help people live but death positivity is just being positive about death itself having talks about it whether it, it can be anything small from having an advanced healthcare directive, letting your family know if it was, if I were to die tomorrow, how would you want to be taken care of? Would you want to be buried, cremated? Just having that talk so that when that d time does come, the burden is less because death is, it's a huge burden. It's not only a financial burden, but it's also an emotional burden. And when one has a good, um, relationship with the talk about death, we can achieve what is known as a good death. A good death is, for example, um, in school we talked about in regards to terminally ill patients. If a patient is openly acknowledged to what's going to happen in regards to their illness and the fact that, yeah, they are dying, by having a healthy relationship to saying, you know what, I am dying, but this is how I feel. This is how we should all feel rather than just ignoring the elephant in the room. That's the way that a good death can be achieved by not only having a good relationship, but being positive mm -hmm. about death. It, it absolutely isn't about, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> no, that's a whole different issue, but death positivity, it's just having a relationship with death. and. We can become real death positive by having that intimate connection back. 
What would you say is the benefits of discussing death, dis even, particularly for those with uh, terminal illness, about discussing it ahead of time? What, what are the benefits? The benefits are, um, I know that you've, have you heard of Dr. Tubler-Ross's five stages? Well, one misconception about the funeral industry is that we go by those. No, Dr. Cuba Ross created those in regards to the patients dying themselves, the stages that they're going through. And I think that if a healthcare um, professional were to, you know, walk on eggshells in regards to a person's illness, they're doing them a disservice. I mean, if I was going to die, I'd want to know so that I can cope with it. That way, if I can cope with it, I can help those around me cope with it. Um, when my uncle was had diagnosed with ALS, he wasn't done. He knew what that would end up with. You know, it's incurable. The, in, the, the end is inevitable. And we had talks about it. Mm -hmm. We had talks about what was to happen after he was gone. Stuff like that. That can aid not only the grieving process of the person who's dying, I mean, I don't expect them to be openly saying, death, come and take me now. No, absolutely not. But it can aid in the family being rest assured that, you know what, this was good. So starting the grieving process early while this person is still alive is anticipatory. It's called anticipatory grief, yeah. And it's basically, um, grief can start, I believe it can start before, during, or way after death. It all depends on your experience and your relationship with death. But with the terminally ill pa um, patient, w with the people around them, they can start to have anticipatory grief. They can recollect on the fact that, oh my gosh, this person's dying. You know, I remember visiting my uncle when he was deteriorating from ALS. Um, my sister, my, my sister wouldn't even go see him because she'd cry and that was her anticipatory grief my aunt um it was to the point where when he passed on it was already you know what we're good his suffering is now done we can try to move on obviously there's still going to be grief but the anticipatory grief it kind of gives you a preview of where it's going okay we have about five minutes left in our interview and I recently read an article that was talking about thatinophobia. Uh, they called it more tourism, more tourism, and it was talking about these feelings of anxiety, panic, fear associated with the realization that we are going to die. Mm -hmm. What are some tips or suggestions that you would give for people who experience that? I mean, we're all in the same boat. I'm going to die. You're going to die. <laughs> um, everybody in this in this house is going to die. What I think is, why are we fighting it? Live. Go the heck outside. Live. So that at the end of the day, it's like I told you, I, I am very okay with the fact that I'm going to die. I could walk out here and get run over, but because of the fact that I opened myself to, I, I, I myself used to be thanatophobic. I used to have necrophobia as well, but me being in this industry I said you know what after putting helping seeing so many people that were young or they had their whole lives ahead of them I said you know what death is the least scary thing for me right now it's this whole world and if I was if I'm just focused on one attribute of life which is the end I'm gonna miss out on everything in between mm -hmm. so being uh, pushed into the death care services you had to really look at what is it i'm afraid of well it's the, when we say push it almost sounds like i went in there unwilling and no i was willing to go into when i entered the industry i'm not gonna lie when i first got in um i couldn't sleep for the first week i was traumatized but then i had a talk with myself and i said you know what this is real all roads led to rome and it led me into the industry and I'm glad for that because otherwise I'd be manic in a corner afraid of my own demise and now I can talk to people. I can tell people what, how to hopefully have a good relationship with death. If anything, I feel my job will be done when someone says, you know what, this was easier for me to talk about. 
this was good. This was a good exercise in regards to um, helping people face their fear. And of course, we're all afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of what's going to be on the other side. Well, while you wait, enjoy life. <laughs> Herman, thank you so much for coming to do this interview and thank educating, <laughs> educating uh, all of our viewers on death positivity and ways to cope with the inevitable. <laughs> um, as we're wrapping up in the last couple minutes, are there any questions that anybody uh, may have for Herman? And if there are any questions, feel free to uh, message me or comment on this video when it's posted onto my page. And Herman, are you open to any? Is there yes, any um, I have uh, my own personal blog. It's known as Adventures in Death Care. It is located on, on Tumblr, adventuresindeathcare.tumblr.com. It's also on Instagram. Right now, the format is kind of diary oriented while I go into, while I go through school. But I guarantee you in a few months, you're going to see a whole rebranding and you're going to hopefully follow me and as I show you everything I can about the industry. So thank you all for joining and stay tuned for more interviews. Bye. -bye.